Hi, my name is Peter, and this is Go Verb and Noun. Last week we talked to Dr. Lindsay Doe, the host and writer for Sexplanations. She told us about what it was like starting up the channel, some of the differences between educating online versus educating in person, and some of the challenges that present themselves when educating about sex ed online. This week we're talking to Nick Jenkins to find out what goes on from the production point of view. He works on Sexplanations and Crash Course, and to both of these channels he brings the viewpoint of somebody who comes to YouTube from a background in film. The result of this is, in my opinion, a degree of polish that you don't often see in YouTube. Even though more and more channels are upgrading their equipment or shooting in high def, the kind of polish I'm talking about isn't just technological. It's the result of a lot of people putting in a lot of work, and of a process that hopefully is about to be a little bit demystified for you. So let's check it out. Hi, I'm Nick Jenkins, and I work for Hank Green and Lindsay Doe on Crash Course and Sexplanation, sometimes uh, SciShow. How did you get involved in YouTube? So I was an independent filmmaker for a long time. I had my degree in filmmaking and graphic design. And I was doing uh, freelance work around Missoula, because I like Missoula and I wanted to stay in Missoula after I finished college. So um, I'd been putting together a reel over year the years and uh, got an email from Michael Gardner, who was basically Hank Green's assistant at the time, talking about, we're starting a YouTube channel and we're doing this and we're doing that, and would you like to be a part of it? We've seen your reel and blah, blah, blah. And I immediately ignored it. Because I, you get a lot of emails when you have a good reel <laughs> that just don't amount to much. And it sort of had all of the earmarks of things that I had sort of learned were not going to pan out correctly. And I didn't know who Hank Green was. I didn't, I didn't know about Vlogbrothers. I didn't know really about anything. I had used YouTube as a resource, but I was not a YouTuber and I had not worked with YouTubers. Uh, and then, I don't know, a week or two later, I'd had a really bad day. Something just, it just was a very frustrating day for some reason. I don't remember if it was because I was teaching or if it was because of freelance, but I got another email from them that was like, hey, we don't know if you got the first email. And since I'd had the bad day, I was like, all right, yeah, I'll go. I'll go meet you guys. Had the meeting. They told me about Crash Course and SciShow that weren't named that yet. They were just saying, we're going to start two educational channels. It sounded great. They explained to me more who Hank was and what they were planning to do and why they wanted my services. And I, I said, okay, yeah, I'm on board with this. And that's pretty much it. What's surprising about YouTube as a medium? I do consider myself a filmmaker, but more than that, I consider myself an educator. So I was most impressed and most surprised with the ability to reach a big number of people for education. That was one of the biggest things to me. And as I've gone on over the last few years, I think the most surprising thing has just been sort of the, the fandoms and how passionate they are. I think that's one of the biggest surprises that Hank is Hank and that Tyler Oakley is Tyler Oakley and all of these things don't really surprise me. Um, but the, the passion and the sort of good-natured passion. Because I grew up as a rock and roll fan. I grew up as a, um, you know, a horror movie fan. And, and sort of, so the good-natured side of it is the side that I'm most impressed with and surprised by, I think. I think that's how it works out for me. On educating online versus in person. First of all, it's numbers. The, the biggest difference for me is just numbers because I'll have a class, online class or a live class, you know, that sort of maxes out between 20 to 2 to 100, something like that. And to look at the views we get on Crash Course, for instance, you realize, oh, there's a lot more people who are able to view this and a lot more people who maybe can't go to university, who don't have access to for-profit education. And so that's important to me because it was always the case with me that I was not interested in an institution as much as I was interested in educating people and helping people get education. So that is one of the most stark differences to me. It's like, this is free. This is people all over the world can get it for the most part, all over the world can get access to this information. One of the other things is it forces me, because I have my own little channel and I do stuff on there, and, and I've used what I've learned here to channel into the classroom. The biggest thing that I learned is that it forces you as a teacher to think about performance and to think about how you're delivering information, what information is valuable, and the speed with which you can deliver information, especially in an online format. Because I would go back and look at some of the videos I'd done before for my online classes, or I would go back and just look at lectures that I would have to give or, or in-class discussions and, and just sort of be aghast at, at 
the pacing with which I would do that. So pacing and really a self-evaluation. I think that's the biggest thing I've learned. It's just a self-evaluation where you have to sit and look at it and go, okay, well, what is the point of this? What am I trying to do? Am I doing that? And is it enjoyable? Is it enjoyable for the students? Is it, is it enjoyable for anybody who would be watching this? And if not, is it something that I can fix? So. Differences between working on crash course versus sexplanations. The main difference between sexplanations and crash course is that crash course has a lot more hands in it. So we have a writer who then reports to our chief editor who then gives me the script and Hank the script and then we both go over it and then if there are any changes it goes back to the chief editor those changes happen or there's a discussion comes back to us we film it with a script supervisor take it I edit it and then give it to our graphics team Thought Cafe they do their stuff that goes back out to the chief editor as well as our consultant Ranjit Bhagwat right now for psychology if there are any changes there that goes back to Thought Cafe then it comes back to me I prep the graphics to go to our sound designer sound designer then does sound gives it back to me I export upload and do all of that with explanations it's just me and Lindsay Lindsay does the writing I look at the script if I have time <laughs> if she's given it to me in enough time Lindsay we then organize a shoot schedule we shoot it come back I cut it we both look at it make sure there are no changes sometimes it's really quick sometimes that takes you know 24 hours to really get everything done and then I do graphics I do sound if there is any and then it goes up so really it's just it's a number of hands involved there's still the same amount of passion on everybody's level in crash courses there is on sexplanations which is another thing that's sort of fascinating to me like everyone from thought cafe to our writers our chief editor our consultant are all very passionate about getting it right and making sure it's useful and making sure it's good um, and entertaining and whatnot so it, it really is to me it's just the amount of people there and that has its own stress there's a lot of stress in it just being me and Lindsay and then there's a lot of stress of having 15 people having a lot to do with it. So one is not easier than the other. One is not better than the other. They're just different experiences. What's something that's important, but maybe not thought about? I think one of the most important things that happens that not a lot of people know about, whether it's Sexplanations or Crash Course or SciShow, is the amount of real thought and preparation that goes into it. Because there, I think a lot of people you notice in comments, it's one of it's one of the only hurtful comments I ever see. Because people can get angry and whatever, but there are times when they say, well, why didn't you know this? Or why didn't you cover this? And it's like, man, we put so much time and so much effort into trying to make sure it works as a cohesive whole. And then we're not saying anything incorrect, but we're human. So sometimes something might slip through. And on Crash Course, it's a lot of people that have to miss it. And occasionally something gets missed. So that's something that I think is important is like how many people have their eyes on this stuff, how many times we review it, how many times we talk to each other about it, and just try to make sure it's all good before it goes live. And I sometimes sense there's a feeling of like it's being thrown together. Uh, or, and I think a lot of people think that it's all Hank. Like Hank writes it, Hank <laughs> does everything because they'll say, well, how come Hank didn't know this? And it's like Hank didn't write it. Hank obviously reviewed it and made sure that he knew what he was talking about in the script, but, you know, it's not a one-person job. It's, it's a lot of people. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think that that is one of the biggest things is to remember that you have a host, and that host is important, but there's a, there are a lot more cogs in the machine uh, going on. And they're all good cogs. Try, we're all trying to make it be something good and be something we can be proud of. How important is editing to the learning process? The importance of editing changes from show to show, if that makes any sense. For instance, on Sexplanations, editing can sometimes completely reinvent an episode where we thought originally it was going to be this way, but we figure out it works better in a different order by completely removing something. So it's very much editing in the macro on that. So it's a lot of big edits that really sort of change that can change an episode. Doesn't always happen, but sometimes it does. With Crash Course, that script has been so finely tuned and reviewed by so many people that normally my rough cut of a Crash Course is the same as the final cut. It's, it, I've gotten so good with the how they need to be cut and, and everything that it, it, 
it's more about what we call editing in the micro, which is the frames. How many frames on the cut? Is it two frames? Oh, that's too much. Let's back it off a little bit. You know, how much is Hank talking over himself? All of that stuff. Those cuts in the micro are important because I've gotten to where I can feel it and audience members can feel it when it cuts too long or too short, whether it's just a complete piece of chaos or whether it's just too long and drawn out. So I've gotten pretty good at that, but occasionally I'll miss one and in the fine cut be like, mm, I need to tighten that um, by a frame, literally a frame. So, you know, 1 24th of a second. It's just got to just a little bit, and that makes the cut come alive. Now, how do those help in education? Obviously, with sexplanations, we're doing the same thing on the micro level, but we're doing more on the macro level, so a lot of order and everything helps to get the information across in a way that is not only useful information, but is also what we feel a good way to lead someone through the topic, so it's not just like, bit of information, bit of information, bit of information. And it all comes back to storytelling. For me so I'll always be talking to Lindsay about her, the story and just sort of saying well we sort of talk about this information here and then we drop it and then we come back and that's gonna be kind of hard to see so because there a way we can thread that through a little bit more with crash course and with editing in the micro it's about making something that is timed well so somebody's gonna sit down and not feel as though they're wasting their time so it's 10 minutes long time to be watching you know, an educational episode of something. So we want to make sure that it's cut well so it feels like one thing, like almost one sentence. So it's not so, it's not so broken up that people just start to fade or look elsewhere. That's the hope anyway. <laughs> what might someone do to make their channel a more effective learning tool? The first is you need to look at who's doing it well. And I'm not saying copy, pay attention to what makes it work so well. A lot of times when we watch a great film, for instance, we sort of end up saying, it's a great film because of the plot, is usually where people go. But usually great plots are accompanied with also great camera work and great acting. And there's a lot of things coming together to make that thing be successful on some level. I mean, this is the one thing I would always tell any students. When you're watching something, whether it's good or bad, you need to pay attention and be able to articulate to someone else what's working and what's not working. Now, typically a student, when they're first starting out in film education, will look at something and say, well, I don't like it because it's stupid. That's not helpful, you know. What makes it stupid? Why is it stupid? And they'll try to articulate, well, because of this one special effect that was bad. And you're like, okay, they had a bad special effect, that's not stupid. So you have to try to get at it. So the key is really pay attention to things. Look at what people are talking about in the comments. Why do they like it? What about it do they like? And and try to come with come up with a holistic feeling. Like what is really making this thing successful? And then look at your work and see what from there applies to my work. Don't just take it all and, and say, well, I'm just going to make, you know, Crash Course 2. I'm going to make something that utilizes what I think is effective, would be effective for my work. You know, initially I would say, uh, well, make it short, but, you know, Veritasium isn't short all the time, and he makes epically good videos. So, you know, it can't always be that way, whereas, you know, CGP Grey makes very short videos most of the time. But there are ways to test yourself, too. If you're going, if you're starting unscripted, write a script. If you're starting scripted, do one without a script. If you're starting out and your videos are 10 minutes long, make a three minute video that has to convey the same information. One of the greatest pieces of editing advice I ever got was for a film I made. And I was showing it to an editor, the guy, his name was Brent White, who edited uh, Knocked Up and The 40 Year Old Virgin, and terrific guy. Uh, and he came up and he watched my film and he said, this is really good. And it was at the time it was 15 minutes. And he said, now you need to make the two minute version. And that piece of advice, of course I didn't go and make the two minute version, but what it did was it made me go through and pinpoint what's important, what can I get rid of, what can I keep, what's necessary to tell the story, and what are just things that I like. And that was the most liberating thing I could do as an editor, was to just basically say, no, I need to tell a story and I need to tell it quickly, so what's important? And then you build from there. And you start saying, here's what I need, how do I then take what I need and then add a little bit more to it to make it enjoyable and to make it fun and to make it whatever. How do I take that and make it fun or enjoyable or whatever? So there are things like that. And that applies to screenwriting as well. 
when you're writing a script for an educational piece of content, you can start off with, oh my God, it's four pages long. That's going to be horrible. Okay, we'll go through what circle, what do I need to actually have in here? And then cut it down from there. Force yourself to do those things. You know, if you just are in it for you and you just want to have a good time making videos, that's great. Make, that's, you know, that's vlogging, really. You know, you go out and do it and have a good time. Work on, you know, uh, working with the community and everything. But if you're trying to really build education, you need to pay attention to who you're educating and what else they're responding to. I think that's the biggest thing for me. So hopefully by now you have a good appreciation of just how much work goes into each of these channels. But more than that, I hope you have a deeper understanding of just how much everyone cares. To be honest, that's what stuck out to me more than anything as I'm talking to these folks, that everyone cares so deeply about what they're doing. And it's so cool and so awesome to see that translated into action. So if you like hearing from passionate people, tune in next week. But for now, let me know either in the comments below or on whatever social media of your choice, you know, either Twitter or Tumblr or by Owl. How do you translate your passion into action? All right, guys, that's all I got. Stay tuned. Thanks for caring. And until next time, go Verbenown.